Good morning. How are we doing? Well, it's a joy to be with you this morning. Um, my name is Ryan, and I'm a pastor in Brea, California. It took me about thanks, perfect uh, 34 minutes to get here this morning, so not bad. And um, the regional director for an organization called Foster the City. And what we do is we help churches start foster care ministries to make an impact in the foster care community in our own backyard. And um, a lot of people, when they think about foster care, they think about being placed with the child in foster care. And that is certainly a significant need in our own county. But there are actually a lot of ways that we as a church collectively can make an impact in the foster care system. And so one of the things that Foster the City does is we have what we call our wraparound support model. So there you have Mountain View Church to the left, and then within that community you have our beautiful fostering family in the center. And then around that foster family are singles and couples and individuals who bring meals, who do child care, who help them carry the responsibility of fostering and welcoming children into their home. The truth is only about 50 to 40 percent of foster parents are going to make it out of their first year because of just the gravity and the emotional weight of what it means to bring a child in their home who's experiencing trauma. But if we wrap that family with a support system, those statistics are completely transformed. And in fact, the one year that Foster the City did data across all our 400-something foster families, we found that 93% of our families who had a support friend team made it out of their first year, as opposed to only 40 or 50%, which is amazing. And that's not a testimony to us. That's a testimony to you. That's the local church, isn't it? Isn't that what God's designed us to do, to love one another, to serve one another, to help one another? And so uh, next week, we have an info meeting, and I would love for you to come. We got the information on the next slide here. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be here at the church from 1230 to 2. Everybody say child care. Child care. Everybody say lunch. lunch. Okay, so we're going to have child care and lunch. We want to remove any obstacles. And we are not a placing agency, so I cannot send you home with a child. I'm like one of the safest people within child welfare to talk to. We can't certify you to foster. We can't send a child home with you. We won't sneak one in your trunk. Unfortunately, that's illegal. I'm working on changing that law, though. It'd be a lot easier to find homes for kids that way. Um, but I would just really implore you to come out. If anything, come out for the free lunch. But just hear how we as a church at Mountain View can get involved and, and make an impact in the hundreds and hundreds of children who are suffering in our own county. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 10. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10 this morning. And um, I want to talk to us about how we grow in compassion in a compassionless world. Um, compassion is one of the most essential aspects of following Jesus. The great 19th century theologian B.B. Warfield in a famous essay on the emotional life of Jesus says this, the emotion which most frequently attributed to Jesus is no doubt compassion. If you look at his whole emotional range within the Gospels, what rises to the surface is his compassion. The beloved preacher Charles Spurgeon also remarked once, if you could sum up the whole character of Christ in reference to ourselves, it might be gathered into this one sentence. He was moved with compassion. When Jesus encountered suffering in our world, he was moved with compassion. When Jesus saw injustice, he was moved with compassion. And when Jesus entered your life in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your crisis, in the middle of your mistakes, he was moved with compassion. If we are serious about the call to imitate Christ and to become Christ-like, we must give significant attention to the cultivation of compassion. But before we do that, we need to acknowledge a massive obstacle to cultivating compassion in our own life. And that is we live in a compassionless world. 
as a whole, when you look out in your own life, in your own personal experiences, you are not bumping up against acts of biblical compassion. Sure, there's a lot of social pleasantries. There's a lot of political correctness and moral posturing. And in general, everyone at the grocery store is nice, right? People are nice to a point. But compassion has nothing to do with being nice. It has to do with suffering with people and entering into their hardship. I'm going to give you a little sample from my own neighborhood. Like I said, I live in the very docile middle class community of Brea, California. And um, just looking around my own neighborhood, it is almost entirely void of compassion. Uh, my neighbor Dave, he's my immediate neighbor, and one day I'm doing dishes in my backyard, and I look over, we share this like tall fence, and I just see a pool net come up over the fence into my backyard and flip over, and he dumps all the leaves in my backyard. And then I'm like, huh, that's odd. I mean, I was like, did I really just see that? And then sure enough, it happens multiple times. So I'm, I'm not a, afraid of confrontation, so I walk out there, and I was like, hey, Dave, how's it going? He's oh, hey. I was like, what you doing? He's all just cleaning out my pool. I was like, I can see that. The leaves are in my backyard now. I was like, I happen to have two land waste bins, because I do for some strange reason. I was like, would you like to borrow one? If you don't have one, I'd be happy to lend it to you. And he was like, oh, no, I have my own land waste bin. I was like, can you let me know why you're putting the leaves in my backyard? He goes, well, they fell from your tree, so I'm just returning them. (laughs) And I have to admit, his reasoning was pretty sound. I didn't have much to say other than, can we please find another solution? Um, The two neighbors across from me have literally only ever stopped me to talk about neighborhood gossip. And two weeks ago, my neighbor's car lit on fire spectacularly. I mean, the engine exploded, then the gas tank exploded, flames over 20 feet high, the whole neighborhood rushed out, and they live immediately behind me, and my wife was there. I was actually at a church event. I'm like rushing home because she just texted me, fire, all caps. Thanks a lot, (laughs) Stacy. And I get home, and we're sitting there listening to the neighbors, and it was heartbreaking because the neighbors were just talking about how this family had it coming because they don't manage and take care of their stuff very well. And if you think about it, even in your own neighborhood, we're not exactly living in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, are we? You have your own stories in your own um, neighborhoods of neighborhood drama and gossip, and the truth is you and I all of the time are being formed into people who do not care about others. We are retreating in isolation and distraction over and over and over, and the world is actually closing off to the very ingredients required to have empathy and compassion on another. This is a significant problem for the follower of Jesus, is it not? Because you and I are called to follow one man, and his name is Jesus. And he would not respond like any of my neighbors if he lived in my neighborhood. And so the story I want to ask this this morning, I just want to ask the simple question, how are we to learn the practice of compassion in a compassionless world? That's our topic today. You guys ready? Okay. Let's uh, turn in your Bibles. If you have them, if not, the text will be behind me um, to Luke chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that is Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. 
Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed and came to where that he was, when he saw him, he had compassion, and he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you need, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go. And do likewise. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be gathered as your people, to just be caught up in musical forms of worship, to ask one another how we're doing, to offer to pray to one another, to laugh together, to just enjoy each other as a family. Lord, I pray that by the time we're done here this morning examining your word and letting your word examine us, we would be caught up in the call to cultivate compassion in our own life. Lord, would you do something great in us and in this church? Would we be known in our neighborhoods as those who are readily available to distribute compassion? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the first thing I want to draw out from this beautiful, beautiful parable that Jesus tells is that practicing compassion requires repentance. So remember, we live in a compassionless world. You are being counterformed to be compassionless. That's a problem because you're followers of Jesus. And I don't know, you guys have read the Gospels. What do you think? Jesus is filled with compassion. And that's what we're called to do as well. How do we get there? Well, the first thing is we practice repentance. So Jesus is walking down the road. He's talking to his disciples. He's interrupted by a lawyer in the ESV. A better translation would be expert in the law, as the Net Bible uh, describes him, because this guy, I mean, if you went to youth group, you wanted him on your Bible trivia team because he knew all the answers, and that meant you were going to get pizza because your group was going to win the Bible trivia. I mean, this, this guy is good. We should be thinking good when we see this man. He's a holy man. He knows the Bible. He has the whole thing memorized. He's the one with all the answers. And he comes to test Jesus. He's not coming to learn from Jesus. He's coming to show Jesus what's up. He's coming to school, Jesus. And so he asked them this very hotly debated question in the first century among rabbis. How do you inherit eternal life? What is the balance between being in the covenant community by grace and practicing the things that the law requires? Does that conversation sound familiar at all? It was still going on back then. And so Jesus, in his brilliance, actually tricks this guy to answering his own question. Jesus knew this was the kind of guy who liked to readily share his opinion. And he does. He answers his own question. And one of the shocks of the text is Jesus does not correct him. He just says, yes, the Shema. Love the Lord your God with everything you got and treat your neighbor to the same degree of care and thoughtfulness you show to yourself. Do this, and you will live. And it's at this point that the expert in the law has not only failed his attempts to trip up Jesus, they have significantly backfired. See, the expert came to expose Jesus as a fraudulent rabbi, untrained by any rabbinical school who breaks the Sabbath. And with these six words, do this and live, The lawyer can no longer hide behind mere theological discussion and insight. He is directly commanded by Jesus to live out the knowledge he has in here in all of his life. And the expert is feeling the conviction of God set in on him. He's terrified that his lack of love for neighbor is going to be exposed and he's going to be a fraud. And so what does he do? He desires to justify himself. 
You can almost hear him throw it out. He's scrambling. He's like, yeah, well, who's my neighbor? And he's asking a very specific question because the common teaching of the day was that your neighbor were people in your immediate community who were also of Jewish ethnicity. In fact, Jesus mentions this in Matthew 5, 43. He says, you have heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That was legit a rabbinical teaching, a teaching that at its core excused you from loving people you didn't like. Isn't that a nice, convenient teaching to believe? God, if I deem you my enemy, therefore I don't have to show you any love or compassion. See, in asking who is my neighbor, the expert is trying to minimize the scope of who he is required to love. The message translation rightly gets this by saying he is looking for a loophole, a way around practicing compassion. There was a short season in my life where I really studied Christian community development. I read books by the civil rights activist John Perkins called Restoring At-Risk Communities. I read this amazing book called When Helping Hurts that I'm sure some of you have read before. Toxic Charity, Good News to the Poor, on and on and on. And so I accumulated this philosophy of caring for the poor. And I was convinced that I had the secret sauce and that everyone else was doing it wrong. And one of my most valued convictions was around food distribution. How are we to feed the poor in a way that we don't harm them, but we empower them? And there was this wonderful young lady at our church. This was like over 10 years ago. Don't judge me too hard, but judge me a little bit. That's the point of the story. And we were talking about it, and she's like, yeah, I serve at our church's food distribution. I was like, oh, interesting. Interesting. Why do you do that? You know, and she's just talking about how much she loves Jesus and she wants to give back. She was awesome. She was amazing. And I was like, you know, well, by handing out food to the poor, you're actually keeping them in poverty. And I begin to go on and on. And I was like, food distribution is out. The way of the future is food co-ops. Because food co-ops, people who are in poverty can buy into it. They have a sense of dignity. They have to work a certain amount of hours. And I just go on and on about food co-ops, which are an amazing idea if you can pull them off and build them. And we left the conversation. How do you think this wonderful follower of Jesus felt after talking to this guy? Huh? About this big. Now, if you were there and you would have said, hey, Ryan, I just, you seem like you're having a great conversation. You're totally making this girl feel a lot of shame, and I don't want to interrupt that, but <laughs> I just hold on a minute. I got a question for you. Um, how many food co-ops have you started? Just, I, I'm sorry, I just want to ask. I, well, zero. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, me either. It's cool. It's cool. But have you ever been to a food co-op before? Well, no. no. I mean, not in person. I've read about them. Have you ever served at one? Do you, have you ever met anyone who's been of a part of a food co-op? Uh, one single person. Well, no, but I read these four books, and I have this philosophy and this theology. And this is to illustrate one of the greatest temptations of following Jesus, is we hide behind what we know so that we don't have to practice it. We feel like it's actually good enough if we know what to do. If we ascribe mentally to the correct theological philosophy, me and God are good. And the truth is that Jesus is looking for fruitfulness. In our own hearts, in our own lives, what God wants from you is to go and do likewise. It's to do the stuff because that's where the blessing is. There's no blessing in intellectually ascribing to the right worldview. The blessing is in living out that worldview. The blessing is in actually loving your neighbor as yourself because in that interchange, you start to find Jesus. And you're walking with God, doing the things that Jesus does, and therefore you are blessed. And repentance gets a bad rap these days. And I think that's in part because there's so many poor forms of it. One form is like the Eeyore form. You guys know the self-pity form? You know the ears, Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? 
Yes? Okay, I got, sorry, it was, concerned me there for a minute. You know, he's like, oh gosh, I sinned again. Better go to church and tell God I'm sorry. Guess I'm going to be like this till I get to heaven. This is just kind of my state of existence. That's, that's self-pity. That's not repentance. The other wrong idea is that this, this twisted up idea that if I confess, if I repent to my life group, to my spouse, to my kids, I'm going to disqualify myself from receiving grace. And in fact, repentance is God's very means of healing us, of working the surgery of the great physician, and he starts to remove that stuff out of our life. Repentance, true repentance is a form of healing. It's a form of intimacy with God. And when you are vulnerable with one another, you draw near to one another, and you actually get closer as a community. And 1 John 1, 9 assures us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us all unrighteousness. The truth is that each and every one of us at times have failed to love the poor. We have failed to show compassion to the marginalized. And Jesus is calling us to repent and start afresh because there is blessing and joy in serving the Lord that God does not want us to miss. The second aspect of this text to help us grow in being people of compassion is that practicing compassion requires proximity. Everyone say proximity. A little bit louder. Proximity. Ah, oh, beautiful. So Jesus sees right through the Bible expert's attempt to justify himself, and he asks this question, who's my neighbor? And Jesus brilliantly teaches in a way that only Jesus can, and he tells him this, this parable, this story. It's of a Jewish traveler going from Jerusalem to Jericho. That was a 17-mile treacherous road up a mountain pass that was notorious for being people getting robbed and mugged because all these caves that robbers could hide out on. And so the story is of our, our Jewish brother here, and he's traveling on this road. He's attacked, he's robbed, he's stripped, and he's left for dead. He's lying on the side of the road. He is in critical condition. Remember, Luke is a doctor. He's giving us a medical diagnosis. He is half dead. If nobody intervenes, this man will die. He is dying, and somebody needs to help him. And Jesus gives you two glimmers of hope in the passage. The first glimmer is there's a priest. And immediately, if you were listening to this story, you should have thought, oh, the man's going to be okay. Because priests were ordained by God to care for God's people. That's what their role was. They were to connect people to God. They were to care. They were to shepherd God's people. Here is a priest and a Jewish man who's literally dying. And what does he do? He passes by on the other side of the road. Your second glimmer of hope is a Levite. This is someone who works at the church. He works at the temple. His job is to help people meet with the Lord. And he too passes by on the other side. And Luke doesn't tell us why. It's possible they didn't want to defile themselves if they would have come in contact with blood or if the man would have died. They would have had to go seven days outside of their routine priestly duties uh, sounds like Nacho Libre there. I've had a lot of priestly duties lately. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, I apologize. It's just nonsense all the way through. But it is really funny. Um, it's possible he was just in a hurry. They're both, they work at the temple, they work at the church, they got services to conduct, sacrifices to offer. They didn't have time. They didn't have time to stop and help. And it's possible they were just scared. Because if this guy was beat up and they lingered too long to help him, maybe they were putting themselves in danger as well. The truth is Luke is silent on why they passed by. But we do know that someone did stop and help. In direct contrast to the religious leaders, the Samaritans saw, and he didn't pass by on the other side. He had compassion and he went to him. He drew near. And this is the contrast Luke wants you to see. The two religious men saw and moved away. The outsider, outcasted Samaritan who Jews hated saw and drew near. He practiced proximity. 
And Jesus' audience would have been immediately insulted by this story. I mean, he's telling a story of a righteous, law-abiding Samaritan when the priest and the Levite turned the other way. See, at the end of the day, following Jesus is not about being accepted into the right crowd. It's about drawing near the right people. It's about following God's heart and his passion to see who is suffering and who is vulnerable and who is half dead among us, whether that's spiritually, physically, emotionally, whatever it is, those in our own community, it starts here. Who, who is suffering among us? Who's going through a hard time? Who's lost a loved one? Who's, who's battling with infertility? Who, who just lost their job? Draw near. Don't come here and pass by on the other side. That's not what Jesus would do. Jesus would draw near. How are you doing? How can I pray for you? What's going on today? And this has certainly been massive in my own story, is learning to practice proximity. I've been a foster parent for the last seven years, and I've had the privilege of having 11 different children come in my home. And God has taught me so much in that process. But I had zero aspirations to be a foster parent. It was never on my radar. It was not something I wanted to do. It all happened when we started doing this thing called Safe Families, and we hosted this 24-year-old boy for a short amount of time. And as I got to know this guy's story, my heart just broke for him. When he was 14 years old, there was a very traumatic incident that left him with significant physical limitations and killed his entire family. He was the only one who survived this incident. And he was 14 years old, and he had no extended family, so he went into the foster care system. And the thing that broke my heart the most about hearing this boy's story was there was no family identified to care for him. He just sat in the system until he graduated out of it. And I was driving with him one day. I know exactly the road we were on. And he loved fantasy video games. Like he, I'm just hours and hours and hours of these fantasy video games. And I'm trying to connect with the guy. We have almost nothing in common. And so I'm just like, you play a lot of video games. Like, tell me about that. And he talks for a while about the different games and player components and level ups. And I didn't understand any of it, but I was just listening. And at the end, he goes, to be honest with you, I only play video games because people haven't been very kind to me in this world. And in that world, nobody can hurt me. And that line has stuck with me ever since. And after months of resistance to my wife of doing foster care, that was the moment where I was like, man, it, nobody took in this 14 boy, 14 year old boy after he had tasted some of the worst medicine that life has to offer. Another thing that I've just learned in my time is that so many of the moms who get their kids removed if you wind the clock back and you look at them as little kids and you hear about what was happening with them, they were neglected. They were abused. They were rejected. They were homeless. They were molested. On and on it goes. And so there's this vicious cycle in our foster care system where, of course, moms are getting their kids taken away. They've never experienced love the way that God wanted them to. They don't know how to parent. They've literally never seen it done before. How can you expect them to do something that they've never experienced before? The only question is, is there anyone compassionate enough to enter their story and break the cycle? Because Jesus loves these kids. Jesus died for these kids. Jesus wants us to wake up and see that these kids are in our own county. And the way that he loves these families, the way he transforms these families is through us the hands and feet of Jesus. And I've been a part of this process for seven years, and it has been messy, and it has been heartbreaking. We have a placement right now of a five-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl, and they are driving me crazy. I mean crazy. They're breaking our stuff all the time. They have massive behaviors. This morning, I was supposed to be here at 7.30, and the tantrums were so big in my house, I physically couldn't leave my house. And yet, by the grace of God, I did leave my house. And I got here at 745, and your pastor graciously was like, it's okay, just drive safe, just, just get here, it's fine. <laughs> it is inconvenient to follow Jesus into hard things, isn't it? But man, I have seen God's presence. 
I have got to know God in a way that I could have never imagined by partnering with him. And so this morning, my question for you is, who is God calling you to move towards? It might not be children and youth in foster care. I hope it is for many of us. But who is God calling you to move towards? Who would benefit from you sitting and listening and being with them, being present and showing them the love of Christ? The last thing I, I want to say, and this will be brief, is that practicing compassion requires offering our resources to God. The Samaritan sees this man half dead on the side of the road. He's in need of compassion, and he opens up his life in a very challenging way. <laughs> I mean, he first uses his own oil and wine to clean and heal the man's immediate wounds. Then he puts the man on his own donkey, and he chooses to walk while the man rides on transportation safely. Then he puts him up in a hotel and he has him stay the night to ensure his recovery. And then he opens up a tab with the innkeeper and says, anything that you need, that he needs, make sure it happens and I will pay for it in full. And then he promises to return and see the man restored to full health. I mean, this is a radical act of kindness. This wasn't pre-planned. This was you in the middle of your errands, in the middle of your doctor's appointments. You see someone in need. You stop everything. You open up your bank account. You invite them in the car. You take them in a hotel. You put them up. You promise to return. You put your whole life on hold because your brother is in need. And that becomes the most important thing in your life. And I don't know about you, but I am overwhelmed by this display of compassion. I am not there yet. <laughs> I'm slowly making my way there, and I believe you can be there, but I am not there yet. And so the question is, what are we supposed to do with this story? I mean, this rat, if he would have done one of those things, it would have been remarkable. But he just pours on grace upon grace upon compassion upon compassion to see this man healed. And I think the first thing we do with this story is we let it motivate us to action. The truth is the punchline of this parable is you go and do likewise. That is, that is the ultimate purpose of Jesus' teaching here. You go and do likewise. This is the stuff of the kingdom of God that you and I are invited to do every single day. But the truth is we can't become this guy overnight. Not possible. Not happening. What we do is we make small decisions now that compound over time that we grow into be a person of compassion. Maybe it's keeping a hygiene kit in your car to hand to someone who's experiencing houselessness. Maybe it is praying each morning, Lord, would you fill me with compassion so I can show your love to other people? Maybe it's reading a book on immigration or refugees or foster care or the housing crisis to get more informed. Maybe it's inviting someone who's lonely in your community over for dinner. There are about a thousand ways you could partner with the Spirit, and you could take one small step today to become a person of compassion. And the last thing we do with this story is we let it point us to Jesus. Because the authority that Christ is saying, you go and do this, go do and likewise, is not off the Good Samaritan. This is a, most likely a parable, a fictional story. Jesus himself is ultimately the Good Samaritan. He is the one who left the riches of heaven to incarnate to enter into our stories. We are the half-dead man on the side of the road, Ephesians tells us, that we were dead in our sins and trespasses, and Jesus didn't keep passing along. He stopped, and he ministered to us, and he didn't just pour out his own wine. He poured out his own blood on the cross, and he's actively working with us to heal the wounds that we have deep inside of our hearts, and he paid the debt we couldn't pay, and he took us not to an innkeeper, but to our Father in heaven for safekeeping and protection. And he promised to return and he sealed us with the down payment of the Holy Spirit saying, I will return for you and I will make all things new. But he's not just the good Samaritan. He's also the fulfillment of the half-dead man on the side of the road. Because this man was betrayed by strangers, but Jesus was betrayed by his own people and his own disciples. And this man was beat and stripped and robbed privately. But Jesus was beat and stripped and robbed 
publicly and shamed so that you and I could have a relationship with God. The only hope we have of becoming more compassionate is to sit with the gospel, is to look into the face of Jesus, to think about what God has done for us and let it transform us so that we start loving other people in a similar way. Man, I hope that you make it out next week. 12.30, right here at the church for lunch in the interest meeting. Maybe it is becoming a support friend. Maybe it is learning more about foster care, being a respite provider to give foster parents a break. I'm telling you, there are so many ways that you can get involved. Please show up next week and see what God wants to do as he plants seeds of compassion in our hearts. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you so much for this text. This, this story in Luke 10 has been one of the most formational passages of Scripture in my life. And I thank you. I thank you that you taught in such invitational and challenging ways. God, I thank you for Mountain View Church. I thank you that there are compassionate people here, that many in this church practice compassion regularly. God, we know that there are many hurting around us whether that's emotional pain or physical pain or relational pain, God. And Holy Spirit, I pray today that you would baptize us in your compassion. God, I pray that, that we would be known as people who move towards the hurting and the broken in love and we bandage their wounds and at great cost to ourselves, we make sure that they are healed because that is what Christ has done for us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you, Jesus, for stopping in the middle of your business when we were dying on the side of the road to save us. I pray this in Jesus' name.